All right, as we wrap up section 5.2, what we really have looked at in 5.2 was this defining of this new notation and something called the definite integral. Now, at this point, we have just two ways uh, to compute this definite integral. So at this point, we have just two ways to compute this definite integral. So one is using our limit definition. And so that's the limit of letting the width of the largest uh, subinterval go to zero. The then equal widths version of that, which is the one we would naturally default to, is the second one here. Limit as n goes to fin infinity of the sum. And then you see the delta x is not delta x sub i, so that assumes the equal widths there. So we've done a number of these. We did a couple at the end of the last section, and then we also did um, one or so in this section. So if you went to the um, top of page 12 here, um, so here was an example where we used that formal limit definition of a linear function. So that's one way to find the definite integral exactly. All right, the other um, kind of way we have is gonna involve, well, we'll just kind of look here, using this area interpretation. So if we have a geometric region where we can just compute the area, we now have to be mindful though, we've discussed how if the region is below the x-axis, you get negative of that area. So really what the definite integral gives you is the area above the x-axis minus the area below the x-axis. So we're going to end by looking at a couple um, where we're just going to use some geometry formulas. So the first one here from negative 4 to definite integral from negative 4 to 0 of the square root 16 minus x squared dx. So we want to get a sketch of this graph. So we want to think about what, um, when we get started here, I really want to think about what is the graph of y equals the square root of 16 minus x squared going to look like. Now certainly, you know, you could graph it on your graphing calculator, but let's kind of think about this. If, if this is not just kind of naturally occurring to you right now as you're looking at this, what the graph would look like. So what I want us to kind of think about, and then hopefully this will make sense, is if I have y equals square root of 16 minus x squared. Okay. If I was to square both sides to get rid of the square root, and we would then have our y squared equals 16 minus x squared. And if we add the x squared to the left-hand side, we have x squared plus y squared equals 16. And this is probably a form that more of you would recognize as being an equation of a circle that has a center at the origin, 0, 0, and with a radius that is equal to the square root of 16, so the square root of 4. So what this tells us then is when we're looking at, and you could confirm this maybe with your graphing calculator, when you're looking at just the positive square root of that, um, so if you were to go backwards and subtract your x squared and then take the plus and minus square root, that's what would be equivalent to the entire circle, both the plus and minus square root. But with just the positive square root, this is just going to then give us the top half of this circle. So that is really what we have here. So we certainly, oh, my line sort of, <laughs> zoop. Okay, try that again. All right, so here's what we have. We have our coordinate plane, and we have a circle, top half of a circle, of radius 4. So here's our top half of a circle of radius 4. And now, if I look at the limits on this, the lower limit of negative 4 up to the upper limit of 0 on this definite integral, that tells me I'm actually only interested in looking at 
this region of the graph. So the part going from negative 4 to 0. So I'm only interested in that area right there. So this is really one fourth of the area of the circle. So as we look at this region right here, so this area is going to be one fourth of the area of the circle, which is going to be our pi r squared. So the radius here, of course, is four. And so we end up with our 16 divided by four. So our area on this is just going to end up being, so our area is just going to be four pi. So the value of this definite integral is equal to four pi. So sometimes we're able to use, we've done triangle regions before, maybe some rectangles here, we were able to use a portion of a circle. All right, so let's look at just a couple other um, short examples that might lead us to um, some generalizations that we want to be aware of. So suppose I was looking at the definite integral from negative 3 to 3 of the absolute value of x dx. So again, I'm focusing on what this would look like graphically and trying to think about if I could just use some geometry here. So the graph of y equals the absolute value of x is really just the line y equals negative x in the second quadrant and the line y equals x over here in the first quadrant. And we are looking at on the interval here from negative 3 over to 3. So that's the region that we're focused on. So again I want this area right in here. So from negative 3 and then all the way over to three. So I'm looking at those two regions here. Well, those are both just triangles, right? Um, so we can just do the area of a triangle is half base times height. And of course, if we're just looking at the absolute value of x, that height is up here at three. And so when we look at these areas, our area is going to be one half the base is 3, and the height is 3. And then same thing over here in the second region. 1 half, the base is 3. I'm sorry about that. If you can hear my dog barking, my apologies. Um, so I have these two um, areas here that I could just simply add up here. Um, so we're going to end up with 9 halves plus 9 halves, and that would just be 9, right? So we're going to get our 9 halves plus 9 halves, and that's just going to be 9. All right, so that makes sense. But the observation that I want us to make on this one is the type of symmetry that you see in this graph. So what I want you to notice here is that, so on this one, I want you to note that this graph is what we call, or this function, um, so y equals the absolute value of x has what we call y-axis symmetry. And then because my limits of integration are both equidistant from, you know, from negative 3 to 3, so y-axis symmetry, let me first also mention, that's another way of saying that the function is even. Um, so you might see that, you're probably more apt to see that vocabulary. So this is an even function. And so this would imply anytime you have an even function, and you're looking at a definite integral from negative a to a of some function that is even, what you're going to be able to do because of symmetry, if you wanted, you could just take twice 
the integral or the area from 0 to a. So that's an option to be aware of. You're going to see that sometimes in the homework um, where maybe they just make that choice to do that or um, they prompt you for maybe that type of an observation. Um, so certainly when you have that kind of symmetry, you could just say, oh, it's just, you know, with an even function, I could just do twice the integral from, in this case, 0 to 3, and that would have been fine as well. All right, so one last example here. Uh, let's take a look at number 3, and I want us to look at the integral from negative 2 to 2 of x to the third dx. And again, right now we're focusing on a few where we're just thinking about the graphs, the graphical interpretations. So the graph of y equals x cubed. So let's take a look at this graph here. And I might have something that looks roughly like that. And we're going from negative 2 to 2. So let's say that, not necessarily drawn to scale, but let's say this is negative 2. And um, over here, let's say, is 2. And so if I think about this one, here we have some region that is below the x-axis. Right? So area-wise, we're looking at this area right here. So I'm looking at that region. And then also we're looking at the area of this region in here. So if I look at these two areas that we have drawn here, it should be somewhat suggestive and hopefully kind of clear here that these two regions have the same areas but one is below the x-axis. So this is not going to be a situation where we're going to take twice the area because we know with definite integrals, we know that it's going to equal that this integral from negative 2 to 2 is going to equal the area that is above the x-axis minus the area that is below the x-axis. That's our geometric interpretation. Well, if these are the same, these are equal to each other, then in this case, because these two areas are equal, that is going to come out to be 0. Now, how do we know for sure that these two areas are exactly equal to each other? Well, what we're getting at here is the notion of an odd function, or one that has origin symmetry. So the graph y equals x cubed has what we call origin symmetry. These are types of functions and things that you study in college algebra or pre-calc, um, which is the same thing as a function being odd. The formal definition of that is that um, f of negative x is equal to the opposite of f of x. Um, but in these situations then, as long as you're looking at a definite integral from, again, negative a to a of some function that is an odd function. So if you have an odd function, then, and if you're going an equidistance um, amount from the you know, from negative 2 to 2. So you have to be going from negative a to a. But then those two areas, if you're odd, those two areas would be equal. And so that's going to mean that your definite integral would always come out to equal 0. So just another little observation here that can sometimes uh, shorten, shorten your work. Okay, so that wraps up section 4.2. What we're going to get into in, or I'm sorry, uh, 5.2. So what we're going to get into in 5.3 is going to be how we can actually uh, evaluate these definite integrals if it's not a nice geometric region, um, because using that limit definition, that could be an awful lot of work, right? So we want to come up with 
and talk about how we can evaluate some of these definite integrals if I can't rely on geometry and if I don't want to have to struggle through um, some of those formal definitions. And right now we have a very limited set of, of problems that we could actually even do with the formal definitions. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about next time. You can see it's probably pretty important when we call it the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that's what we're going to talk about next time in 5.3.